The Omega-3 Index was a uh, concocted over a beer wow. in 2002. I was sitting at a meeting in Chicago with uh, Dr. Von Schacke, Clemens Von Schacke, a good friend who was a, a uh, cardiologist in Munich. Mm. Both of us have been in the Omega-3 space for quite a while. And just that year at that American Heart meeting had been presented a paper from the Harvard group showing that a high omega-3 index was associated with a, about a 90% lower odds of sudden cardiac death in the U.S. Physicians Health Study. And we were going, okay people, wake up. This is a risk marker. This is a written, just like cholesterol, mm -hmm. like blood pressure, this is a risk factor that you can modify, and doctors ought to be able to have access to that so they can treat their patients based on, and improve their health. And so he and I said, well, we got to come up with something. Somebody ought to have a test. Mm -hmm. Well, you start a lab, he started a lab in Germany, I started a lab in the U.S. And then we wrote a paper laying out the logic and the evidence for the omega-3 index being, that's where he named it, the omega-3 index, mm -hmm. uh, in 2004. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at helloned.com. Leaders in an organic and biodynamically grown full spectrum hemp derived phytocannabinoid blend that you can use to optimize your recovery, mood, sleep, and much more. It's also delivered in an organic MCT oil liquid. What I like to do kind of best practices to optimize my sleep and recovery is put a full dropper full in my tongue, let it sit there for 30 to 45 seconds before swallowing, and do that before bed, roughly 15 to 20 minutes before bed. You can deepen and enhance your sleep without altering your sleep architecture. So as a listener of High Intensity Health, you can support your sleep and your body's endocannabinoid system by going over to helloned.com, forward H-I-H, to save 20% off their amazing broad-spectrum hemp-derived phytocannabinoid blend. Links are below, and one more time, that URL is helloned.com, forward H-I-H, and be sure to use the coupon code H-I-H at checkout. So with that, friends, let's cut back to it with Bill Harris. This is an awesome discussion. I've been a huge fan of omega-3 fatty acid testing, omega-3s for a long time. And as you'll hear very, very soon, I used to actually sell Bill's technology back in 2008, 2009, when I was working for SpectraCell when they licensed the technology from Omega Quant. So I'm very familiar with this. I've retested my levels multiple times, changing diet, changing supplements. Like this is a really, really fun conversation. Show notes are below. And be sure to head on over to omegaquant.com and get your test. It's only $49 on the internet. So it's an amazing finger prick, basically just like testing your glucose or ketones. So it's very easy to do. I recommend doing it to prove whether or not, or to see whether or not the foods that you're eating and the supplements that you are or aren't taking, if they are working. So check that out. I hope you enjoy the show. If you do, please hit that like button, definitely subscribe. And let's cut back to it with Bill. Well, Bill, thanks so much for coming on. You really bet. great Thank to be you with you. coming out. Just want to let our listeners know, and, and I sent you this in the email. So back in 2009, when SpectraCell licensed your technology, I was a sales rep for, okay. for essentially indirectly for you, selling the omega-3 index testing to doctors. And I got really excited about it back then. Um, surprisingly, and I would love your perspective on this, it seems that the doctors were like, okay, cool, but it wasn't like they jumped to it right away. They were still kind of really focused on LDL cholesterol, particle number, lipids. Um, but some of the research that you've unearthed in the past, say, 15 years, is that fair to say, roughly? Mm -hmm. um, the, a low omega-3 index is, uh, you know, indicative of poor cardiovascular outcomes and all-cause mortality, and there's a, a lot of data there. Right, there's a lot of data, and I think the idea, part of the, the problem is omega-3 suffer from being in the nutrition world. Mm. So Not they get the, kind of poo-pooed? They get poo-pooed or, or dis disregarded, I think, by the mm -hmm. medical community in, in general. Uh, you know, eat a healthy diet and you'll be good. You've heard that a million times. Yeah. Um, and so omega-3s, they fall under that umbrella and people think, well, you know, it's just a nutrient. Yeah. It can't really be that important. Uh, well, you know, tell that to the guys who were <coughs> sailing on those ships in the 18th century and <laughs> scurvy, you know. It's a great point. I mean, it really is an interesting analogy, and I, I, it's not original to me, but yeah. I've heard other guys say, look at all these symptoms that these guys had, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be absence of one nutrient. And you could say that for every essential nutrient. Mm -hmm. It's more subtle with the omega-3s because uh, it's a life, it, it's not, your teeth don't fall out in a week, you know, like with scurvy. Right. Uh, but in any event, uh, I, I think there's been a, 
reluctance on the medical community's part to embrace the omega-3 index or embrace omega-3 fatty acids. That's part of the problem as well. Mm -hmm. There have been, a, as you know, a real uh, up and down uh, roller coaster ride for omega-3s since, uh, since 1980s, uh, where good, bad, good, bad, no try, all these trials don't work, well, mm -hmm. they're all underdosed, then you do a trial that works, it's up, and it's up again. And, and so the omega-3 index doesn't necessarily depend on supplementation, mm -hmm. per se. It's a marker of right. risk, and it can be affected by, obviously, supplementation, but it's there to pr predict events whether you're taking supplements or not. Mm. Which was, yeah, very interesting. I, I, I took, I, I've been taking fish oil for a long time, being in this industry. I took a few months off and then I got my omega quant retested and uh, it came back at 5.8%, which is just below kind of the critical range. Would you say 6% is kind 6 of- 6% is good. Scraping yeah. by, you're it, a C it's student. It's above average, <laughs> sort of for yeah. young guys like you. Right, so I was surprised, you know, because we have backyard chickens, we eat grass-fed beef, we do, we do a lot to like optimize our nutrition. And I was very surprised in a, uh, uh, like, I was like, wow, I mean, maybe I need to crank up my fish consumption and everything like that. So um, I can imagine people that are eating processed food, junk food, not really taking that extra step. I mean, their levels are in the around, around 3%. Yeah, 3 to 4, right. And what does that mean from a all-cause mortality, uh, like heart disease risk perspective? From the well, general? yeah, when we've looked at the difference between a 4% risk, excuse me, a risk for death, many cause uh, put people at 4% versus 8%. The level of uh, reduction in risk for death is like 35% over a window of time. Obviously, if you do a study and you wait long enough, everybody dies. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, during a window of 7 to 15 years of, in an elderly person's life, if you have a high omega-3 index, your chances of dying in that window are 35 percent less is what mm -hmm. we published recently so that that's regardless of how you got it there mm -hmm. i mean whether it's from eating food for that's normal biology for you or you took supplements didn't make any difference it's having the level that's the important thing interesting now is this causal so is having a low <laughs> omega-3 index like i guess for people everyone wants to know the chicken or the egg and then I would love to kind of tease apart some of the mechanisms that you yeah. talked about in your papers, but so I guess what's going on physiologically when there is a, a low omega-3 index that would put you at risk for all-cause mortality or heart disease or et cetera? Yeah, it's, it's a good question and it's so, it's complicated because it's like vitamin C, again. Uh, we're talking deep in biology, deep in metabolism. Every cell mm -hmm. has got omega-3 in its membranes and the omega-3s are, it's hard to say, this in layman's terms, but it's they're basically it's almost like a, an oil in your car. It just it makes things run more smoothly. And if you haven't got enough oil in your engine, it's a little bit low for a long time. It just wears out faster. Mm -hmm. And the omega threes, I mean, it certainly is not a lubrication in that sense. But that's sort of the analogy. It's a rusting, a prevention of rust. It's another image I have used. Um, but anti-inflammatory. They certainly are anti-inflammatory. Uh, and they change cell membrane flexibility, fluidity, and that that in and of itself sounds like, well, so what? Well, there's you know thousands of these receptors and membrane proteins that are all buried in the membrane, and if they got room to move around in the membrane, then they can work better if they're kind of stiff because they have got these non-omega-3s, no PUFAs in the membrane, then they don't do their job so well. They don't communicate mm -hmm. and message get lost and regulation gets upset. And so the omega-3s do it that way. I think just by virtue of what they do in membranes, plus they have these anti-inflammatory products that they get, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, other oxygenated products that are anti-inflammatory. Um, and then they can prevent platelets from getting sticky, mm. and they lower triglycerides, and they lower blood pressure. But those are all secondary effects to the cellular effect. Interesting, yeah. It seems like in recent years, the, um, the metabolites of EPA and DHA, the uh, selective response, the, the pro-resolving mediators, as they're called, and that to me is pretty exciting. Now companies are now selling the, instead of just pure DHA or EPA, they're selling the derivatives of those to help really kind of 
quell inflammation or, or modulate mm -hmm. inflammation. Mm -hmm. So I think becoming more like a drug. In that yeah, sense. Uh, yeah, and that's. Uh, I mean, I think that's a really interesting, from a biological point of view, whether those products are actually any better mm -hmm. than just giving the parent fatty acids and letting the body make those Where it that they've been fit. tested. Yeah. You know, nobody's ever compared, you know, give, you know, give the same amount of the, uh, the specialized pro-resolving mediator as you get from taking a fish oil pill. Mm -hmm. Do you get any difference in outcome? You know, this, this is 10 times more expensive right. than this is, you know. Let's, be practical totally yeah but anyway it's the, the field is expanding and yeah it, it's very exciting probably exciting for you because you've been talking about this for a very long time yeah your, right, your right. first paper in this area was it 2004 was that when that was published first paper in the omega-3 index uh -huh. yeah first paper in omega-3 was uh, 1980 wow oh my gosh yeah. so what initially because that's that's a long time ago, right? Yeah, what yeah. what got you inspired by omega threes way back then? Um, I was forced to get interested in it. My my mentor, my professor, mm -hmm. um, when I finished my PhD, which was in nutrition, I went and did a postdoctoral fellowship with a guy named Bill Connor okay. in Portland, Oregon, and he was very interested in dietary fats and what they did to cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. And in those days, we knew that animal fats hard fats uh, would raise cholesterol and polyunsaturated vegetable oils lower cholesterol. Mm -hmm. um, they were liquid. Uh, the, so the, the, the kind of the f simple question was, well, we know hard animal fats raise cholesterol. Is it because they're animal or is it because they're solid? Mm -hmm. Is it their physical properties or is it the origin, the kind of creature it comes from? Is it, mm -hmm. is it a plantness or is it liquidness? That's important. And so Dr. Connor said, well, here's fish oil. It's from an animal, but it's liquid mm. at room temperature. Which we talk. So what does that do to cholesterol? Well, it's toss up. So we, we did, he assigned me to do a metabolic study. We fed a bunch of volunteers a lot of fish oil. All of their fat was fish, salmon oil. Wow. We gave them two salmon steaks a day, and we gave them about a half a cup of salmon oil to drink every day just flat out drink. It was 25 grams of EPA DHA. Whoa. Which, you know, in those days, we didn't know. We were just yeah. gonna say, if this doesn't work, we're not even gonna chase this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, but lo and behold, it lowered cholesterol, uh, just like the vegetable oil did. <clears throat> so we said, oh, fish oil lowers cholesterol. Hmm. So it's not really the species specific, it's the nature of the it's oil. It's the nature of the oil. But yeah, as it turns out, in hindsight, once we started actually giving people pills and didn't change their entire diet because mm -hmm. those these are metabolic wars so we fed them everything and we changed all their saturated fats out for polyunsaturated omega-3s or omega-6s and the omega-6 and omega-3 work the same on cholesterol hmm. and it turned out it really wasn't that these were so much lowering on cholesterol as the saturated fat raised it and you take the saturated fat out cholesterol goes down you can replace it with cardboard it doesn't make any difference hmm. the saturated fat causes LDL cholesterol to go up and you take that away, you give something else mono, poly, or whatever, it's going to go down in those studies. When we finally gave people fish oil pills and didn't change their diet, then cholesterol did not go down. Mm. And in fact, in some people, it went up, which was one of those bumps on the roller coaster, mid 80s. We published in 1985, I think it was, that giving people, we gave them uh, six grams of omega 3, EPA, DHA, and ApoB went up in certain dyslipidemias. Oh, okay. Um, triglycerides went down, but in some of them, ApoB went up, and we went, ah! What's going on here? <laughs> and then, then fish oil companies that were advertising, take this to lower your cholesterol, got uh, nasty grams from the FDA, saying, mm. no, it doesn't. you got to stop saying that. So this was an isolated, you know, subpopulation in which the, the omega-3s caused the ApoBs to increase? Yeah, typically people with, with very high triglycerides. They're the ones that will see an increase in um, LDL mm. as the triglycerides go down. The same thing happens with phenofibrate. Uh, an anything that lowers triglycerides in these types of patients will, and, and, and these patients also have low baseline LDL levels. Mm. So, a you know if, if your level is 50, and it goes up to 75, mm. you got a 50 percent increase. So it freaks terrible. people out. No, yeah, a 50% increase. Right. Horrible. Well, look at the real numbers. And where are you ending up? You're still at low risk. Mm -hmm. 
but 50% increase. So that's kind of what's, that was part of what's going on now with the EPA only products versus EPA plus DHA, because um, the folks who are, who are promoting EPA only products are saying that, you know, don't take EPA plus DHA because DHA raises LDL. Well, they forget a lot of the caveats, mm -hmm. like the specific kind of patient and the specific dose. Um, but in most people, it doesn't. In fact, we have a, I think it was a recent uh, a paper that I was on, uh, a statement from the American Heart mm -hmm. Association on the effects of omega-3 on lipids. And we found, I think, nine or ten different trials where EPA and DHA was given to people with high triglycerides, and none of them did LDL cholesterol go up significantly. Mm. Interesting. I was wondering what the impetus was for the isolated or the purified, you know, high concentrated EPA for cardiovascular related. Yeah. So the impetus of the product's Vasipa. It's called Icosapent ethyl. Mm -hmm. Is the, the generic name. It is EPA ethyl esters. Uh, it was originally produced in Japan under the name of Epidil in the 1980s. Um, the Japanese uh, thought it was the active omega-3 based on some, some studies that are the early Eskimo studies were like. Um, and so they developed a drug and got it approved in Japan for um, reducing atherosclerosis. And so that is the product that essentially became Vasipa. Mm. Um, and that product worked in uh, the biggest study to date, which was back in 2007, the Jealous study, mm -hmm. which was EPA only versus no, not versus placebo, versus usual care. But that study showed a uh, prevention of cardiovascular events, even in Japan, hmm. which was amazing. But that, that pro now why EPA? EPA competes with arachidonic acid and platelet function and all mm -hmm. this sort of thing. So, there was a, certainly a rationale for EPA being active. Um, we didn't know as much about the biology of DHA at the time. And I think we know now, in my opinion, you need both of them. Mm -hmm. So you're not a fan of isolating one or the other necessarily? Not really. I mean, yeah. I think it, clearly EPA works mm -hmm. at four grams a day. That, that's the dose that was used in the most recent Reduce It study. Mm. But if you use four grams of EPA plus DHA, I think you're also going to get an effect. And we'll find out here in about a year when oh. a, a even bigger study reports out that's comparing four grams of EPA plus DHA together mm. in the same patient population as was in Reducid. So I think it'll work. Interesting. I would yeah. love to talk more about that. Going back to the early 80s when you were dosing yeah. 25 grams plus per day, um, you know, I think higher doses of fish oil have been used, at least some personal trainer, uh, the, the late Charles Pollock, when you used to recommend them for fat loss for people. And we can talk about beta oxidation later. Yeah. Um, depression, they've been used higher dosages. Did Maybe you weren't looking at this back then, but, but did anyone report, I feel better, my depression is gone? Like, what were the, some of the side? Uh, we didn't do the, those kind of doses very long at all. Okay. That was two or three studies, uh, feeding studies. And they were all focused on atherosclerosis, and there were, you know, 20, 30 people. Yeah. So cool. there's not enough people to, you know, even if one person said their depression got better. It didn't really matter. We, we, we wouldn't have known it, and we weren't even thinking about that in those yeah. days. It was all focused on blood lipids mm. and platelets. So, so uh, we, we don't know. But okay. I, you're, you're right. I think, in general, dose is really going to become an important deal now. Mm -hmm. Which is why I think the omega-3 index is important, which I guess we'll get to later, because yeah. it's reaching a certain blood level is the point. Right. Not just whether you're taking omega-3 or not. Right, which is key. Yeah, and it gives you a biomarker. And one of the biomarkers in the clinic that I worked at, uh, an MD uh, mentor, a friend of mine, Gerard Guillory, uh, he used to use fish oil a lot for triglyceride reduction. This was before I knew about your test. This was in 2006 he started. Mm -hmm. So any patients that came in with elevated liver enzymes, LFTs, AST, ALT, GGT, high triglycerides, it worked like a champ. Like two to four grams of fish oil, take it, it would, it would drop triglycerides between 20, 40% sometimes on yeah. the high end. Yeah. And I assume you mean two to four grams of EPA, DHA. Correct. The combination. Yeah. yeah. And I, I thought that was pretty remarkable because you know, there's other drugs out there, maybe a little niacin or, you know, pharmaceuticals that have a litany of side effects, and this was a natural compound. And so it opened up, and I, I can see why traditional 
medicine doesn't like this, but it opens up the idea that to people that, wow, these natural things can affect my physiology. What else could I do to change my body instead of rely upon a drug? So mm -hmm. in your papers, mm -hmm. you talk about, I think it was a paper in 2011, I could be off on the date, why does fish oil reduce triglycerides? And I yeah. remember reading that thing, and that's so cool how it affects these, uh, I believe it was the different, um, how non-esterified fatty acids released from the fat cells, how they're metabolized. That and was part of our observation. Yeah, we, you know, people have known for a long time that omega-3s, if you, you, you squirt them on top of liver cells in a Petri dish, you know, mm -hmm. and watch their metabolism, they'll make less triglyceride. Omega-3s will just suppress the, it, it activates genes that shut, or shuts down genes that make triglycerides. So that's mm -hmm. one, you know, kind of no-brainer explanation. But is that what's happening in the body? And you know, you can't just take cells and squirt Scrap. stuff on it and call it call it good. Yeah. You, know, you got to look at other things. And so, I, in concert with a colleague uh, who's now a professor at Penn State, Greg Shear, uh, who was the first author on that paper, I think, um, he he uh, did some really good calculations that probably was omega three suppressing the the loss of NEFA, or the release of NEFA from adipose tissue, mm -hmm. which is the primary source of fatty acids for triglyceride synthesis in the liver. A little drop in that, even a drop that you don't, that's hard to detect, mm -hmm. wouldn't take much at all to produce the triglyceride reduction that we see in in vivo in people. So we think that's part of the mechanism. And you talked about adipocyte inflammation, which I think for some people is kind of a new concept, how yeah. fat cells become inflamed. And I thought that was pretty interesting in that paper is one of the proposed mechanisms as to how this is, how fish oil might, might affect triglycerides is by kind of cooling down the inflammatory response within the fat cells. And I, I think it's a, a neat narrative because people don't really think about that. They're like, oh, I just want to get rid of this stuff. But they don't realize that it's a source of inflammation. If you take small dosages of these powerful fish oils, they can reduce that inflammation and affect yeah. other things. That, that to me was exciting. Yeah, it was just, yeah, sure. The concept of fat cells being inflammatory is, is that itself is a fairly new concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, relatively 10, 15 years. Yeah, um, but it's it's something that um, I, I think we've uh, really advanced in that level of science, and the omega threes do play a role there, and they're not alone doing it. But that's right. one of the things that they multiple things they do. It's pretty exciting. And then um, the, the concept of increasing beta oxidation, is that pr another primary role? Of um, again, that happens when, when we uh, study the kinetics of the, the um, production and, and release and clearance of fatty acids from the blood. Uh, one of the effects was um, an increased beta oxidation, increased burning. Mm -hmm. um, but the omega-3s, in, in my experience, and I think the global experience of the omega-3 world is they don't help with weight loss. I mean, you do, there have been hundreds and thousands of people who have been studied on fish oil versus placebo mm -hmm. for X, Y, and Z disease, usually cardiovascular. Yeah. And they report the body weight like they always do at the beginning and the end, and, and body weight doesn't change even though they get benefit, you mm -hmm. know, cardiovascular benefit. Um, and I think we would have seen, if, over all these years, if there was really a um, meaningful effect of omega-3 on body weight, it would have shown up. I mean, I'm, it, I'm, I'm not saying in combination or in high doses that we haven't used before. Uh, you know, I mean, Japanese people eat a lot of omega-3 and they're smaller than we are. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that is <laughs> gonna explain it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, it's, it's been one of those areas that people have, I've heard people say, take omega-3 to help lose weight. And I go, well, maybe, maybe it affects your appetite. Mm -hmm. Or does some, something else. But it doesn't, it doesn't really show up in terms of at the bathroom scale. Mm -hmm. Could be a change in body composition, always. But Well, yeah. it's interesting you, you bring that up. There was one paper that I remember reading showing that the, it was a placebo-controlled study, mm -hmm. uh, and compared to the placebo group, the fish oil group, when they were doing resistance training and, and aerobics, it was a combination of weight training, that they preserved more lean muscle mass, so that they, the body composition did change. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah. So I you thought know. maybe it has a muscle sparing effect, so that you, know, you, you preserve the mass when you're losing weight, I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, um, yeah and I, I've seen studies like that, and um, they're intriguing. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't remember what the dose of omega-3 was in those studies. Yeah. But you know, it, may, it may take a high dose to do it. High, I mean, three, four grams. Mm -hmm. Instead of, you know, half a gram, which mm -hmm. a lot of times people use. Yeah. You call it high. It's not high. 
Um, definitely want to get into testing and so forth. But there's a yeah. gentleman, I think he's passed now, Ray Pete. Have you heard that name? Mm -hmm. See, he's on the blog sphere. I don't know his medical credentials or, or what have you, but he has a popular blog. And he's an anti-fish oil uh, person. And he's cited some, some small, smaller studies in my, uh, from what I recall showing that uh, taking omega-3s will increase pro-oxidant levels in the body and they're a source of you know, oxidative stress and this and that. And um, like I said, very small papers. What would you say on that? Well, one thing about omega-3s is they are the most studied nutrient on the planet in terms of numbers of papers, yeah. um, more than any other nutrient, partly because they're easy to study. We don't eat, there's not much here. It's not like protein or carb. You can't take carb out of the diet completely or protein out. Omega-3s, we don't eat much and you can put them in a pill and you can study them like a drug even though they're a nutrient. Um, so the most studies, so there are, I think there are actually more studies on omega-3 than almost any other compound in, on the planet. Aspirin, statins, I mean, they're, they're, it's huge the number mm -hmm. of papers. So, point is, you do that many studies you can find a negative study anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. You can find neutral studies, you can find negative studies, you can find positive studies. So it really takes, it's, it's not hard for somebody who's got an agenda to find something like that. But right. you know, look at the big picture, death, death is reduced. Mm -hmm. Cardiovascular disease instance is reduced. I mean, I don't care what happens to the molecules in your body and some, something may go up over here, that maybe looked bad like an oxidation product or something. And you measure that, and fish oil raises that, and you go, oh, oh. But, but then you do body counts. Mm -hmm. P there, there's probably 10 other things coming up over here that are contradicting that. You didn't measure these things. Right. You measured that one. And because you didn't measure these, you didn't know that they were completely blocking this effect. And so you assume that, and this happens all the time, mm -hmm. people will measure one thing in a study and assume A causes B without measuring, the, it's, it's again like dripping DHA on a cell in a mm -hmm. test tube. You can't call that biology. Right. And so these kind of things pop up. Um, Omega-3s have been shown to be antioxidant, not just anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. They should be pro-oxidant because of their double bonds. Mm. They should they should react to oxygen, but one reason or another they don't. They uh, can be they can prevent oxidation. So the the double bonds would be um, for whatever reason trans fats come to mind. So similar like that, but it, they don't function molecularly on on that similar level. Yeah, well, so EPA has five double bonds in the molecule. DHA has six double bonds, and mm. every um, the double bond is a site where oxygen can react and make. The peroxide, it's called. Yeah. Um, so the more, I mean, it's why trans fats are used in foods, they were, mm. uh, because they were taking uh, oils that had lots of double bonds in them, eight linoleic acid, two double bonds per molecule, and converting it to one or zero double bonds. So there's no place for oxygen to react once you've hydrogenated it, and therefore it doesn't go rancid, and it will stay on the shelf for years and stay good, mm -hmm. quote, quote. Um, and so the food companies love that, you know, because they, their product doesn't go bad. Don't have to refrigerate it, mm. you know. Um, so in the same sense, the omega-3s have a lot, I mean, that's why they smell bad, mm. in a way, because if you let them in the oxygen, they'll, they'll oxidize and mm. they'll smell pretty bad. But if they're in capsules, they're protected. If they're in fish um, and you eat the fish, you know, the day you cook it yeah. and not four days later. <laughs> Yeah, um, but e even then, there's I mean, there's there's plenty of good evidence that even taking oxidized fish oil, intentionally, grossly, putridly oxidized fish oil, which people have done mm -hmm. to study the effects um, on biology, still beneficial. Still beneficial. I said they can't find any in the the body takes care of it, wow. cleans it up. I mean, they they would take. <laughs> This is getting off subject, but I assume no, you can edit this thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they take a vat of fish oil and they take pure oxygen and bubble it through them for like three or four days. Yeah. I mean, I totally oxidize it. Right. Then they put it in capsules and then they give it to volunteers and then they measure in the blood oxidation products over a month. Mm -hmm. Can't find anything. Wow. 
<laughs> that's incredible. Okay. Cool. That's amazing. Is it because the dosages are, are pretty low? I mean, yes. Yeah. The actual one or two number. grams. So, so yeah. Okay. You, right. you create some, you know, oxidative stress, but you're talking about. Whereas if you eat, say, 400 grams of carbohydrates, I mean, it, you know, yes, that's yeah. a, you think about the, the relative comparison of quantity. That's the, right, and people miss that. Yeah, particularly you eating two or three fish oil pills that might have a, a tenth of a picogram of, of an oxid or of a mercury or something in mm. there. You get all excited. Yeah. You know, look at the doses. Doses are critically important. Right. Yeah. Super. Very, very small. Very interesting. Um, so yeah, uh, in the last 10 years, I, I followed the Google alerts on the omega-3 index and, and so forth, and, and um, some of the papers that I've seen have, as of late are pretty interesting. Uh, individuals that have higher prevalence of like causing crime, like more fights and stuff in jail. One, one, one was like, I don't know how they quantify, there was a standardized way to quantify behavior. Yeah. And individuals that have a history of like all these really violent crimes compared to individuals that are there for like embezzling money or something, uh, there's a, connection between the omega, low omega-3 index and violent crimes. And so it's not just cardiovascular disease that well, we're seeing. Behavior, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm, not, I'm familiar with the prison study, uh -huh. at least a couple prison studies. I'm not, I'm not, I'd, I love your idea. Uh, if maybe somebody's already done it, this whole thing about what are you in there for? Mm -hmm. And how does the omega-3 affect your behavior in there? But yeah, so, uh, Australians have done several studies in this and found that uh, prisoners who are more um, who cause more trouble mm -hmm. in the prison have lower omega-3 levels. Yeah. And they're doing a study right now, the obvious study, supplement, you know, pick prison A and prison B, mm -hmm. virtually the same demographic essentially. Sure. Placebo, active omega-3, and then just track the number of violent incidents, incidents in the two prisons and see if it makes a difference. Wow. That's in Australia right now, ongoing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's cool. This is going to be cool. That's amazing. But I'd like to see you doing it now. <clears throat> you know, white collar prison versus a, you know, yeah, I don't know it, together what it's called. <laughs> maybe I am misconveying what the study. I think it was plus one biology, maybe last year or something like that. But it, I believe it. it well, had, send it to me. If okay. Fine. I'd like to because it's, it's not leaping to mind, but I'd like to see it. I love um, those kind of studies. Totally. I, I think it's super fascinating. An another study about panic and paranoia showed, I believe, individuals that have really low omega-3 index are more susceptible to well, anxiety, at least. I, I know there was a, a, a meta-analysis on, on the omega-3 effect on anxiety. Mm. I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. Where it was, it showed a significant benefit, you know, yeah. not as good as a you know, standard tranquilizer or anything, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a nutrient. Come on, it's not a drug. Right. You know, and sometimes we expect the medical community to get back to them expect big hits right and they're used to drugs and for nutrients which are, we're talking about a life lifetime of consumption not not a year right uh, that's where the omega-3s are and again prevention is always plays in the back seat of to treatment mm -hmm. in in the medical world so there's no money in it no money in it yeah, but the big hits come with big side effects, right? Because you're blocking usually a yeah. key enzymatic pathway that has downstream. So Absolutely. that's why I like all the yeah. off-target benefits of omega-3s are exciting to me. They are, they are. And I, I'll, I'll talk about you know, some of the studies that have been done recently. And yeah. you see a 10% you know, reduction in risk for cardiovascular disease. That's fantastic. And zero risk. Zero. So, I mean, even if there was a 1% reduction in mm -hmm. risk for cardiovascular if there's no downside, there's no harm, then the risk-benefit ratio is favorable. Right. You should do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's often forgotten. The, the people, the, the medical world will, will say, well, it's not a very big effect. Well, yeah. There's, there's, it, it's cheap and it's harmless. Mm. Why not do it? It's a good I point. Mean, anyway. A um, few final questions and then we'd love to get into testing. Are you concerned in individuals based upon the data and, and people you've had conversations with uh, from a cardiovascular risk standpoint, LDL cholesterol. I know it's very controversial. Uh, and a lot of people that are going on the ketogenic diet, these lean mass hyperresponders have really, you know, high HDL, low triglycerides, but then sometimes our LDL will jump up to kind of repartition lipids throughout the body. Um, are, are you concerned about, like, for yourself, maybe your friends and family really having a low LDL? I don't think about it a lot. Yeah. I used to. Uh, 20 years ago, and that's when I, I focused on LDL. Um, but, you know, I think 
uh, you know, I mean, it's certainly the, 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 the writ large, having a high LDL is probably not a great thing. But you, you can't just hang all of cardiovascular disease on LDL. You just can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, nor can you hang it on HDL. I mean, HDL has been an abject failure as a target for intervention. Mm. You know, you know what I mean? Because like giving people niacin and then there's you know, you know, study you know, a. There have been multiple drugs that mm. have given to people that all are fantastic at raising L, excuse me HDL levels, and they don't reduce risk at all. Some of them increased risk for death or or whatever cardiovascular outcome, and people are going. What the What's going on? Yeah. I don't get it. And, and so, you know, billions of dollars have been spent on trying to find a drug that raises HDLs in order to lower risk. Mm. They haven't found anything yet. Hmm. They can raise the HDL, but it isn't lowering risk. So having a high HDL is a good thing. We know that from epidemiologic studies. But forcing it up there with a drug doesn't seem to. So there's more biology here than we understand. Um, so LDL, back to your question. Yeah, I mean, my, if I had a multiple choice question, I had to pick as LDL, high LDL, good or bad, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would say bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's a lot of nuance to that. And uh, of course, the, the, the and I'm, I'm certainly no expert in keto diets or these things that will raise, I mean, naturally they'll raise LDL levels um, and what their long-term effects and cardiovascular health are. I don't think anybody knows. Mm. Have, they certainly haven't been studied in more more than maybe a year. Yeah, I don't. You, you know this. I don't. I, mean, I don't believe there's nobody's been any done a ten year study. Or, yeah, no, and there's not going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I, I don't really know what to say. Yeah. about that one. I just say get your omega three index up. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> and then not worry so much about the LDL. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's dive into it. So the omega three index. Um, maybe we can just talk about the background because um, yeah. you know different studies will look at say whole blood uh, lipids, right? And, and and what you have you know developed and now you, you offer as a test, which we'll link below, which is fantastic. I recommend everyone do it like once a year just to oh, see yeah. where you're at, see where your diet's you. at. <laughs> I agree um, too. Really affordable. I mean, at least I paid fifty bucks for it. Yeah. Does that sound about right? That's a, yeah. That's the online price, right? Very affordable. I mean, um, and so what would Let's talk about maybe percentages, so people understand the, the percentages. The average American is like what, three point eight percent? No, no, probably four to five percent. The average mm-hmm. American, if you look at the, the large population studies, uh, something in that neighborhood. So yeah, the so the omega three index, just to be clear, is the amount of EPA and DHA in a, a red cell, red blood cell membrane. Mm-hmm. Um, and we analyze it by separating out the red blood cells and then measuring, and measuring the fatty acids in the membrane. Because the, the red cell is, because it's a cell uh, and has a membrane, like every other cell in the body, it's a reflection of those other cells, but it's mm. easy to get to. Right. You don't have to you know, biopsy, biopsy something. Yeah, right. Um, and they're typically thrown away. In most, you, know, you go to your doctors, you go to the lab and they draw a blood tube, uh, it, they Spin it care down. about the, pl- the plasma or the serum, yeah. the clear stuff. That's where they measure almost everything in. And then you throw the red cells away. So while well, the red cells are there, it's a rich source of information, I think. Uh, so the EPA, DHA in the red cell expressed as a percent of the total fatty acids. So mm-hmm. if there's 100 fatty acids, I mean, there's millions, but say there's 100 fatty acids in the membrane. And if, if uh, three of them are DHA and one of them is EPA, then you've got four out of a hundred, four percent. Mm. That's your omega-3 index. Mm. The typical American, again, four or five percent. Uh, typical Japanese, nine, ten percent. Um, Spain, they eat a lot of sardines. They get about six percent on average, six and a half, seven percent. So it, it tracks with how much fish you eat, typical, uh, writ large, mm-hmm. as a population. Um, we think, based on a lot of evidence, that having an 8% omega-3 index, 8 to 12 approximately, up in that area, kind of Japanese levels, is really the target level for optimal cardiovascular health. Yeah. Um, getting there is not easy. Most Americans, again, start say, say you start at 4%, which is typical. Yeah. Um, we've published some papers recently say that, that say you're gonna need probably 1,500 milligrams of EPA and DHA a day to go from that 4% up to roughly 8% over 
three or four months. Mm -hmm. It's about how long it takes to really stabilize. Because mm. uh, you want all the red blood cells to replace themselves, and it takes four months for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we like to recommend people do it every four to six months after they make a change. Uh, so an omega-3 index of 8% is the goal target. Um, that's what we think is optimal. Uh, if you're at seven percent, I don't think you're like deficient or some. You know, you're gonna get your affairs in order, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's a graded scale, very right. much graded scale. And if you're at six percent, you're way better off than you're at three percent. Mm -hmm. And you could be a little better off at eight percent. You know, but that's like every risk marker is like that. Um, so yeah, the omega three index was a uh, concocted over a beer wow. in two thousand and two. Uh, with I was sitting at a meeting in Chicago with uh, Dr. Von Shackey, Clemens Von Shackey, a good friend who was a, a uh, cardiologist in Munich. Mm. Both of us have been in the omega-3 space for quite a while. And just that year at that American Heart meeting had been presented a paper from the Harvard group showing that a high omega-3 index was associated with a, about a 90% lower odds of sudden cardiac death in the U.S. Physician's Health Study. And we're going, okay, people, wake up. This is a risk marker. This is a just like cholesterol, mm -hmm. like blood pressure, this is a risk factor that you can modify. And doctors ought to be able to have access to that so they can treat their patients based and improve their health. And so he and I said, we well, gotta come up with something. Let's, somebody ought to have a test. Mm -hmm. Well, you start a lab, he started a lab in Germany, I started a lab in the U.S. And then we wrote a paper laying out the logic and the evidence for the omega-3 index being, that's where he named it, the omega-3 index, uh, mm -hmm. in 2004. And I've been riding that horse ever since. My, my goal has been to see you know, what other diseases are related to the omega-3 index and what benefit can that have to patients uh, in, the, in the medical community. Uh, We've, we've left cardiovascular disease, and now we're looking at prenatal mm. stuff, and that's really fascinating. Um, Dr. Jackson, Christina Jackson, works in our lab. She's kind of an expert on that. And you know, there's good evidence now that pregnant women who have a, a red cell DHA level, just DHA, not EPA and DHA, of a, about 5% when they're pregnant are um, at lower risk, when we'll put it this way. If you have an omega-3 index down at under five, say around 3%, and not omega-3 index, I should say, red cell DHA. We call it prenatal DHA. That's I the see. test we do. Yeah. If the prenatal DHA is around 3%, uh, the evidence to date is that your risk for premature birth is about 10 times higher than it wow. is if it's 5% or higher. Um, which is, and omega-3s do prolong gestation. Mm. So, which makes sense, you have less premature birth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, a hot field now where, particularly in, in OB, we're hoping to get doctors who are taking care of pregnant women to just test their omega-3 levels. They're all supposed to be taking DHA. It's right. in the supplements. Yeah. But there's no incentive. They don't know if they're low or not. Or there's no, they're, if, they, if they know they're really low, well, then there's a good incentive to take your DHA. And um, in any event, I, I digress back into the prenatal. But the omega-3s across the whole lifespan are right. important. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, some of the research that I've done, I, I think some of the studies are underdosed with when women that are pregnant, they're given to the official oil, whatever, and they look at intelligence quotient, they look at various cognitive parameters and things like that. And, and so it's not, these are kind of longer term, almost epidemiological studies. I don't think they're you know, randomized controlled trials, at least from what I've read. So it is kind of interesting on the, the prenatal side. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I like, and I recommend all female clients that I work with, like get the fish wheels up and it right. makes, it makes right. a big. Have and, have take a test. Yeah, <laughs> that's and and for 50 at. bucks. I mean, come on. The, a lot of people now in their late 20s, early 30s are going to these fertility clinics, spending a ton of money. Oh, my goodness, I mean, if they could just spend $50 and then invest in a good fish wheel, oh, yeah. get that DHA yeah. up. Yeah, and, and there's some, I mean, you mentioned fertility clinics. I mean, there's some evidence the omega-3s help on the male and the female side of, of in vitro fertilization. So. Wow and implantation. Mm -hmm. So it's, moms gets, I mean, they're just at the, 
so deeply embedded in biology and, and oh, yeah. metabolism that they're important in all kinds of diseases and conditions. Absolutely. Um, so cardiovascular, we talked about mood, brain health. Yeah. Um, before we kind of finish up on testing, did we miss any other big disease? Well, I, I think it's worth mentioning that cancer probably, I mean, to date, we really can't say the omega-3s are, you know, knocking it out of the park on cancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a little suggestion here and there with really high dose or that particular form of cancer. But by and large, it's not been, I mean, it doesn't hurt anything. Um, but it's not an anti-cancer agent, though, which in a, in a way I like. Because, you know, otherwise, if, if the omega-3s fix everything, then they become snake oil. Yeah. yeah. So here's something major that mm -hmm. they really don't seem to play a role in at, at this point. I mean, I, I, I talk to people who say, well, if you're taking at least five or six grams of your DHA, you'll knock that cancer. Mm. Okay, cool. Happened to you? I'm glad. I, right. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so the, the omega-3s don't do everything, but they do a lot. And uh, it, there's no reason not to get an omega-3 level up to 8%. Yeah. In terms of downside? I mean, no very, downside. Very, no, yeah. I mean, well, it costs you costs money, money to eat more fish, take supplements. Uh, and I don't really care what supplement you take. I'm pretty agnostic on supplements. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't you know, promote any kind, particular supplement. I just want to get your EPA and DHA up. Yeah. Now, when it comes to forms, ethylester, triglyceride, monoglyceride, right. uh, companies are, are duking it out out there. What's You've been studying this for a long time. Well, yeah, clearly ethyl esters, which is the most one of the most common forms now for the high, for the concentrates, um, do need to be taken with food and you know, mm. probably with fatty food, with, with some fat in the meal, to be absorbed better. If they're taken on an empty stomach; they're not absorbed very well. Mm. Uh, whereas a monoglyceride or triglyceride, even um, free fatty acid, phospholipid forms, they're not so. Uh, not so dependent upon the, uh, having a meal. I see. Um, so the, again, a very, very common form is with the ethyl esters. You should take with food. And then that Im improves. It doesn't really make them still quite as absorbable as, as the triglyceride. So I, you mm -hmm. still need to take a little more of an ethyl ester to get the same bump on the omega-3 index as mm -hmm. you do with the triglyceride. Um, but uh, it, it's not, you know, some of the early advertisements for the phospholipid forms were mm -hmm. a little crazy. You know four, five hundred percent improved absorption. That's mm. impossible. You, you can't do that. I mean, a triglyceride oil is a is hundred percent absorbed. Mm -hmm. You know, give it a day, you know, yeah. give it a little time, it'll be absorbed. You can't improve on that. Mm. I mean, you can make it faster. Yeah, yeah. It can be, you know, in three hours instead of six hours, but who cares? You know, it, it's what's the effect on the long term, on the omega-3 index that I care about. I don't really care about what happens in one day. Mm -hmm this fish oil product versus that one. That makes okay. sense. Anyway. Yeah, it was, you know, Stanford University did a study, a major company uh, in the fish oil space compared their own triglyceride to their own ethyl ester mm -hmm. and looked at triglycerides in terms of outcomes after 12 weeks and omega-3 index and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they actually, you never heard about the study because it didn't show what they wanted it to show. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really interesting. I mean, anytime people bring up- what you, Did you see like an abstract on it and then I, it never turned into a paper? Well, no, it, it was published in kind of an obscure journal, but it, on the company's marketing, they never talked about this because they really heavily promoted their triglyceride-based fish oil. And that's not what this study found to be. Interesting. Well, you know, God was, bless them for publishing anyway because yeah. you can't find it. I'd like to know, the, I'd like to see that study. Oh, I'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah it's okay. pretty funny. <laughs> um, so retest, you give yourself six months to build up body stores? Four, four to six, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine was in the fall. So, I'll, and I was, I thought for sure, I'm like, I'm going to be hovering around seven. Well, you mentioned, you know, grass-fed beef yeah. and stuff. And, and I think there's a misconception that mm -hmm. they are rich in omega-3. Well, they're not. I mean, they, grass, beef, they have, they have a rumen, right? Mm -hmm. They have the, all these stomachs. And part of their digestive system is to have bacteria to chew up grass and other stuff they're eating, and the bacteria hydrogenate polyunsaturated fatty acids. They destroy polyunsaturated fatty acids, so including alpha linolenic acid, which is the precursor to EPA and DHA. Uh, so you can't just feed, even feeding fish oils to cows, which the only thing I know it does, it reduces the CO2, or the, the, the methane, the, the farting, mm -hmm. save the planet. Um, 
even that is not going to get it into the meat because it mm -hmm. can't get past that stomach and without getting d destroyed by these bacteria. And so the studies I've, I've looked at <clears throat> comparing grass-fed to, to um, grain-fed beef, yeah, there's, you know, you, you get this much EPA and DHA in the uh, grass-fed and you get <laughs> that much and it's 70% higher, wow. but the number is so small. Mm. It's not a great story, it's, you know. Yeah. That, that's, that's the problem. I, the same percent increases yeah, is misleading. Uh, because you go from you know a tenth of a percent to two tenths of a percent, omega right. three. Well, that's a hundred percent increase, mm. but it's you aren't eating any more. Right. Quantities. I, I mean, I, it, the grass fed stuff is fine. It's, mm. it's good for a lot of other things, but it's not a source. You know, don't eat that instead of salmon. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Very interesting. I didn't know that about the uh, the stomachs that the bacteria just break it down. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Mm. Bio. They hydrogenate. Wow, these polyunsaturated oils. That's why they're, you know, they're beef or the, the flesh contains saturated fats. Mm. Oh, because they're hydrogenated by yeah. the bacteria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Any nice. oils that they eat, any fats they eat. Inter you mentioned the uh, if you feed cattle omega threes that they produce less methane. There was actually a, I can't remember. I think it's in Canada or maybe it's in Ireland. They're feeding seaweed to cows. Have you seen that no. circulating recently? Is that yeah. NPR or something like well, that? It could be. And now, you know, seaweed doesn't really have much omega-3. Mm. Um, there are certain algaes, I mean, single-celled algae, not, mm. uh, not seaweeds, which are obviously huge things. But the, there are certain species of single-celled algae that make EPA and DHA. Okay. You know, they're the ones that are used um, for the vegan to DHA. vegan DHA, yeah, and yeah. vegan EPA. Uh, but those are very special. You don't eat those things. You don't eat. Mm -hmm. um, they are. Uh, but anyway, so I, I get the feeling that if someone thinks algae, they think seaweed. seaweed. Yeah, I might have been screwing that up. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, different seaweed may have great effects. But yeah. there was, but there was a report of omega three being fed years ago because there mm. was some cartoon about cows and. Farts and, and farts and you know, what it does to the environment. <laughs> it's it's a really controversial issue right now, right? With all the vegan burgers and, and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I have, not, I, have I had one? I'm not sure I've had it. What? I haven't. Okay. It's canola oil and, and Oh, wheat. is it? Yeah, it's really... Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, um, and so what's, what's your impression of the omega-3 role in the keto diet? Yeah, it's a it's a good. Uh, I think for the inflammation, I think that okay. can be the aspect of it that that would be beneficial for individuals that can help them. You know, because a lot of people that are attracted to keto are usually they're overweight, they have some sort of autoimmune or depressive issue, insulin resistance, mm -hmm. and so on. And you know, those are all areas, in my opinion, based upon the research that I've done, that omega threes have some. Um, you know, some links to affecting from a mechanistic standpoint. Yeah, also, sure. I think it adds a, a food qualitative <laughs> aspect because you and I can go keto and eat salami and pizza and cheese, yeah. right? But it's like, are we gonna improve our health doing that? Yeah. It might be in ketosis, but so I think having tests that, that kind of indirectly quantify the health of the diet, including the omega-3 index is. So if, ate, if you want keto and ate a lot of salmon, that's a yeah. whole different thing than eating a lot of beef. Right, yeah. and cheese and salami and yeah, yeah, fast yeah. food, whatever. Yeah, right, So good point. So yeah, Great. I think it's I think it's important, uh, and then brain health as well. And there was another aspect. This Dr. Dan was he the one? Dan who? Johnston. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was saying uh, at a conference that the high, and I could be mistaking the the for the de novo lipogenesis for mm -hmm. people that are insulin resistant. They're creating a lot of lipids from a new. He likes to look at your tests and look at the palmitate levels because it's an indicator per his research or interpretation of de novo lipogenesis. Is mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I think so. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, w we've seen at least in one study that a higher palmitate level, palmitate is 16 carbons, zero double bonds, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a saturated fatty acid. Higher levels of that are associated with increased risk for diabetes mm -hmm. in, in the women's health study where we did this. Yeah. Um, and so we think that, yeah, that there's a lot of things that can influence it because you eat, you eat palmitic acid too mm -hmm. in a lot of foods, you make it so whether it's you're making it or you're eating it, um, maybe a difference, maybe have a different health effect. Um, palmetto lake is like that too, 16-1, mm. omega-7. Um, seems like having higher levels of that is also a marker of de novo lipogenesis. 
uh, and but feeding it may be beneficial for you. I mean, yeah. it's a weird thing. Um, so anyway, the I, th I think uh, we have a lot of lot yet to learn in what in fatty acid patterns and yeah. profiles that we're just starting. Omega three is just the the. Uh, Lowest hanging fruit on that, the most obvious things. Mm. But I, I know there's, there's, I think, good evidence that higher omega-6 levels in the blood are protective against cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Mm. Uh, a couple of big multi-group multi studies where they, you know, meta-analysis, where they looked at um, blood levels of linoleic acid or arachidonic acid and then follow people for diabetes or for cardiovascular disease, two different papers, um, found that higher levels of the omega of little leg were protective for both those diseases. Yeah. Arachidonic acid was neutral, didn't predict increased risk or decreased risk, um, which kind of plays against the whole omega-6 are bad mm -hmm. story, which is very controversial. But I, I, again, I think, you know, count the bodies. Just mm. don't, I, so many people who get into the omega-6 are bad thing will look at a metabolic chart and show that this pathway, the omega-3s feed this pathway, and this omega-6 does this on the, this inflammatory marker. Well, okay, but at the end of the day, who's getting sick and who's not? And, you know, if, if, if you're finding that consistently people with higher linoleic acid levels in their blood are less likely to have at least two major diseases, cardio. I mean, maybe they're, maybe they're more depressed. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something, maybe they got rheumatoid arthritis. I don't know, you know. But at least diabetes and heart disease, there's less risk um, in, the, in those two uh, big studies. So wow. I, I think there's a lot, still a lot to be learned about it. fatty acids, omega-3 for sure, omega-6, and monos and trans and saturates and all of them. They mm -hmm. all have a story to tell. So do you intentionally avoid like canola oil or safflower oil or grapeseed oil in your diet? No. I, I mean, I don't go out of my way to get them, but mm -hmm. I, I don't intentionally avoid them. Yeah. Um, I don't make much of my own food, though. So I go out and eat it, yeah. Well, or Kathy makes it, or you know. Right. <clears throat> right. But it's, you know. So, you know, we don't, I, I focus on omega-3. I mm -hmm. take fish oil and I eat fish. And yeah. So. <laughs> and what's your omega-3 index, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, it's around 10. Okay. Um, I, I try to keep it up because my blood, I, I go to the blood bank every couple of months and they take a unit of blood out and mm. we split it up into little aliquots and stick it in the freezer and use it as controls for our assays here. So oh, cool. We want to have a high level of omega-3 control for our study and a low omega-3. Mm. So we always run, in every batch of samples we run, we have a, a known high and a known low. We got to get the same answer, mm. assay after assay. Who's the low control? Just it's a random sample? Just a random a bag of blood they're about to throw away from oh, the yeah. blood bank because you know, nobody's taking high omega-3. Those, right. those are invariably low in omega-3. Really? We're you can almost, it's like clockwork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So. Isn't that interesting? So um, you eat fish, what, four days a week? No, no, no. Maybe two. Okay. So salmon? Think, for the, yeah, primarily salmon. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in terms of quantities of fish oil, EPA, DHA combos? Yeah, I take, I try to get about three grams a day, EPA, DHA. Mm -hmm. And use, you know, I don't really have any one go-to product. You know, sometimes people will send me a bottle. Say, yeah. Take it. Here you go, take it. Or yeah. like, I go to a big box store and buy a bottle, and right. that's okay. You right, know. that's awesome. I don't get too excited about it. Yeah. Uh, so we have two two final questions here, and I think I might know uh, what your answer would be. And we've asked every guest on the show if you're stranded on a desert island and, and you can just bring like one thing with you <laughs> from an herb supplement, whole food. Um, what you probably say fish oil, but what would what would come with you? Like, is there some natural product that you really like? Wow, well, interesting. Well. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'd bring as many calories as I could mm -hmm. <laughs> from whatever source if I want to stay alive. Yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, right, sure, the softball, I, I, I bring omega-3. Mm -hmm. I think, that, I think, is, at least for the Western diet, the, the nutrient that is the most missing. Mm -hmm. That well, we don't need to take things, well, I'm sure we need to take calories out. 
We need to eat less and move more. I mean, that's obvious. But um, from a single nutrient point of view, yeah, EPA and DHA, not ALA. Right, right. Um, so, Bill, you've been doing this research for the better part of close to four years now, right? And a lot of people kind of jump around from different career paths and everything like that. It's more of like kind of a personal question. Uh, what drives you or, or what sort of, is there something in your routine that, that sets you up for success to really publish a lot of research, connect with these different you know, researchers um, to run this great business? Like, is there, is there some characteristic or something that you do in your... In your well, it's a good question. I, I don't know, I've just been lucky. I mean, if I had if I'd picked vitamin E as my focus nutrient, you know, mm -hmm. when I was early in my career, I don't think it would have gone very far. It's kind of, there hasn't been a lot of great evidence that, you know, I mean, not to pick on vitamin E, yeah. but, but just omega-3 just happened to be, I was just lucky, I think, to be there right at the beginning of the show mm -hmm. and, and get publications out and, and find out a lot of fun things about them. Um, I still don't like the way they taste, but, mm -hmm. you know, but, I mean, it's not them, okay, right. it's the other stuff that's... Anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's anything. I, I've just been blessed to be in a field where I can just keep going and keep going and the, the studies keep coming out positive and yeah. it's good. You know, it's wonderful. How much of success do you think luck contributes to? You know, because there's certain people that just try hard, try hard, but they seem like they can't get a break or they can't, it doesn't work out. Think? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I believe in providence at some level. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm a Christian. Uh, and I'm not sure how that impacts my it's science, right. but yeah. it's it's uh, part of my me and my my belief system, and um, believe in God and that there is a designed pattern to life, and mm -hmm. um, it's not just a, a jumble of, of, of uh, chemicals that got popped together somehow. It's just it's just beyond, way beyond faith to believe that in my mm -hmm. mind, um, and how that uh, certainly is not clear to me how that's directed my path, but maybe there's been a guiding hand on my shoulder mm. that I don't know about, but yeah. I'm thankful for it. That's cool. I like that. Good. Um, if you were to bump, maybe this has happened to you, but if you were to bump shoulders with a politician in an elevator, they said, Bill, okay. yeah, you've been studying this research for you know better part of 40 years. Um, what sort of policy level thing can we change to improve the health of Oh, wow. yeah. What would, you, what would you want them to know? Well, yeah. Um, if they were somebody who had some control of the FDA, I, I would say get the FDA to approve omega-3 testing and recommend omega-3, I mean, get U.S. government official recommendation, get a official dietary guideline that says you need this much EPA and DHA, because mm. absent that, we, we can't, so many things can't be said about you know, supplements particularly, or foods, you can't label a can of tuna with omega-3 if there's no dietary value to which this can be compared. So without that, you can't put how much omega-3, what a great source of omega-3 it is. Mm -hmm. So anyway, politician to FDA, um, to whatever extent politicians can uh, help us increase production of omega-3, whether it's uh, through microalgae or through its aquaculture. Mm. Yeah, and there's a lot of work being done on, uh, because of the limited supply of fish in the ocean, I mean, it seems like a lot, but, yeah. you know, a lot of groups are working on plant-based, land-based omega-3 products, mm. um, but it takes gene modification to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, take a canola oil or a soybean oil and put in five or six different genes from some other uh, algae, and now you're growing canola that's got EPA in it, mm. and you just harvest it. Wow. And unlimited supply. How much mm. land do you got? You know, mm -hmm. and there's no, and no more taking it from fish. Mm. I mean, that's cool, but it's going to take some a political agenda that it gets rid of the fear of GMOs. Right. Interesting. And so, it, and that would be great for human health, you know, yeah, yeah. I think if we could do that. But there's obstacles. Right. Totally. 
Yeah. Amazing. Well, I really appreciate your time. Yeah. And all the work that you're doing, Bill. Thank you so much for coming on. Sure. So, so the primary website, I'll put links to many of the articles that, that I've read over the years. Great. Love Great. friends. And then it's omegaquant.com. Omegaquant.com. Omega Quantify. So that's the Omega Quant. So I just took a tour upstairs, amazing facility, and now you're also starting to test vitamin D, or yeah. is that in the it's in it's in the in the works in the plan, right? Right. So would that be a separate sample, or you could add that on if you so choose down the road? It would be probably the second drop. Cool. One drop for the omega three, one drop for the on one piece of paper for vitamin D. That's yeah. Awesome. So much you could do with Bullet Boy, yeah. which is really cool. So, uh, friends, very grateful that you're still here tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the content. If you did, please hit that like button. If you're not yet subscribed, please do so because we launch videos like this all the time and I know you don't want to miss them. So have an awesome day.